So we're going to pick up where we left off with biotechnology. So this is going to be part two of unit five. So with biotechnology, we've been able to actually change things around and use biotechnology in order to improve health, improve crops, and change organisms' um, genetic makeup. So biotechnology is going to be producing and improving things like agriculture, for example. So you can take certain genes that you wish to see in plants that you grow, and you can actually insert those genes into the plants so they exhibit that trait. So what exactly is biotechnology? Well, biotechnology is going to be a form of genetic engineering. The manipulation of organisms' genetic material by adding, deleting, or transplanting genes from one organism to another to alter the organisms in useful ways. Things that we do this with, for example, are going to be better tasting tomatoes. And they've actually added the gene to make some tomatoes grow purple. That adds in that reversatol that's going to be able to help with um, antioxidants. We can use it to treat disease. For example, we have things like E. coli, which are going to grow the um, insulin that people need. So you can take a gene for human insulin, insert it into E. coli, and it can produce mass amounts of insulin that can be used with diabetics. We can also use it to make plants and animals more adapted for their environment. So if you want to grow a certain plant in an area that's going to be extremely dry, you can add a more hardy or resistant gene to it so it does not dry out and so it still grows well. So biotech advances in human health are going to fall into three categories. First, you have what produces medicines to treat disease. You can cure diseases or prevent diseases from occurring in the first place. Now with these medicines that we use to treat disease, that's going to be something like the insulin that we talked about. In order to cure diseases, we're actually um, using different types of technology like CRISPR technology where you can go and you can insert a gene to replace a gene that might have been a faulty gene that coded for something wrong so you could replace it so it codes for a functioning gene that would work properly or you can even change it around and prevent it from even causing that that disease in the first place so looking at some different things that are genetically modified we see that we have this uh, cauliflower and they've made it into several different colors and different pigments. Like I said, with the different pigments, lots of times it works with different antioxidants. The um, plants that you see up top, lots of them are going to be genetically modified in order to be able to uh, grow in certain conditions. Then you see the wine over to the side. Lots of times they genetically modify that or maybe even modify the yeast that goes into it to help produce the alcohol that is going to be formed within the wine. The guy on the left hand bottom, he is getting a vaccine. Lots of these vaccines are going to be genetically modified in order to be able to produce certain um, antibodies in your body. And so your body reacts, it's able to pick up on the organism that it needs to attack, and it makes it able to be more efficient in attacking that organism like a virus. And then we see on the right hand bottom, they are looking at corn. So there's lots and lots of different types of genetically modified corn. Now, how do you do this? You're going to have five steps in biotechnology to actually insert this gene. So the first thing is called the chop step. It goes and it looks for the DNA that it wants. It identifies it and it chops that gene out. So you selected the gene that you need and you're going to cut it out. Next, you're going to amplify that gene. So you're going to take that small amount and you stick it through a um, polymerase chain reaction, which is going to create hundreds or billions of that copy of the gene. Then you're going to take the gene that you made a lot of and you're going to insert it into a bacterial cell. From there, that bacteria can grow colonies that contain that gene with that donor DNA. And then you'll identify those colonies that have received the DNA that contains the gene of interest that you want to work with. So with the chopping part, you go in, you chop the DNA from the donor organism, and you select it for whatever trait that you're looking for. Once you take the DNA from that organism and cut it into small pieces, you're going to do that using the restriction enzyme. So there's certain enzymes that you have that look for certain areas within a gene that can cut it. 
The restriction enzyme cuts the DNA by recognizing it's a 4 to 8 base pair sequence. And so that key tool that's going to be used in DNA um, cutting or with biotechnology is going to be this restriction enzyme. And so all biotechnology is going to involve this process. And so you see here it goes in, it identifies the section that it wants. Once it identifies it, it looks for the sections at the beginning and end of that gene where the restriction enzymes are, and it's going to use those to cut that gene out. Then you need to amplify. So amplifying the DNA into more useful quantities, because if you just have one copy of that gene, if you mess it up, or if you only use it once and let's say it didn't take, then you don't have any more of that gene. So we need to make more. In order to make more, you put it through a process known as polymerase chain reaction, or a PCR. It's going to be in a laboratory. It's an actual technique that they use to allow a tiny bit of DNA to be amplified into many, many, many um, of that same form. So it could go into hundreds, if not thousands or billions of copies of that gene that you're looking for. And so in order to do this, it goes through a specific process. The DNA is going to be heated, so it separates into two pieces. It's then going to be cooled in an enzyme called DNA polymerase, and a large number of free nucleotides that are added to the DNA mixture are going to come together. So you had the two strands of your double helix. Basically what this is doing is breaking those hydrogen bonds in the center and opening it up. Now those free floating nucleotides that are floating around are going to come in and they're going to form complementary strands. And so it makes more of that DNA. So now you have, when you started, you had one strand double helix, you opened it up. Now you have two strands. You would do that again and again until you have billions of copies. So this is just a visual of that polymerase chain reaction and what's happening. Next, you're going to insert that gene. So inserting foreign DNA into the target organism is going to usually take that DNA and you're going to put it into a bacteria because bacteria are going to be great organisms in order to transfer. The bacteria takes up the gene in a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid and the plasmid's going to be duplicated every time that bacteria divides. On average, the average bacteria divides around um, once every 20 minutes. So it divides pretty quickly. And so here are, uh, here's the visual of what's actually going on. So you have that target segment of DNA. You have your plasmid. You're going to go in. You're going to open it up. You insert that section. It closes back together. Usually you do this through a heat shock, so you would heat it, open it up, and then cool it to close it back. Once it's inserted, then you allow that bacteria to multiply and divide. And when it um, divides and makes more and more, you're going to have lots of copies of that gene. And so when you're growing it, that bacterial colony that carries that specific gene with the DNA, Every time the bacteria divides, it's going to create a clone of that DNA. So genetically identical cells that have that DNA that you're interested in. So it can produce large number of clones within that gene or with that gene. And all of the different bacterial cells containing all the different fragments of the original DNA. And that is going to be called a clone library or sometimes referred to as a gene library. And so here they have taken several different genes, they've cut them, they've made more of them, they've inserted them into a specific bacteria, then they've allowed that bacteria to grow, and as it grows it makes more and more copies of the DNA that you want, and then you end up with your gene library. So now you're going to identify the bacterial colonies that have received the gene of interest. And so the gene library has a lot of info, but in no particular order. So you're going to have to go through and you're going to have to screen it in order to pick up on which ones actually have taken in the gene. And those um, cells are going to be hybrids. And so that's going to be a technique called hybridization. So within hybridization, the bacteria that may carry the gene of interest are going to be washed with a chemical, and it's going to break the DNA into single strands again. So we're breaking those hydrogen bonds. It's going to use DNA probes that are going to be radioactive when it's washed over the DNA. 
And so the DNA that contains the specific sequence that we're looking for is going to actually bind to that area and it's going to cause it to glow in that single strand. So we're going to be able to pick out the gene of interest very easily. And so this just gives you a visual of what they're doing. Transgenic organisms are going to be organisms that carry DNA from a donor species. So most modern biotechnology applications are going to involve the transfer of genes from one species to another. And so when it does that, then we refer to that organism as a transgenic organism. So it has its own DNA, but it also has DNA from other species that was donated to it. Usually this DNA is going to be found in a plasmid when it's transmitting that gene over. Lots of times, like I said, we use the bacteria E. coli. And so we're going to use it to make things like insulin and even to make things like human growth hormone. So in summary, biotechnology is the use of technology to modify organisms, cells, and their molecules to achieve practical benefits. Modern molecular methods are going to make it possible to cut and copy DNA from one organism and deliver it into another. Biotechnology is going to have achieved some important success in medicine, as well as agriculture and forensics. Now, treating disease with and producing um, medicines with biotechnology. So we're going to be able to cure diseases, treat diseases. And like I said, we've already talked about the treatment of diabetes by putting it into E. coli and having them take up that gene and create human insulin. So diabetes is going to be a disease where the body cannot produce the chemical insulin, which is going to help to break down sugar in foods. Now, sometimes the pancreas slows down or quits the production of this, or sometimes you become insulin resistant. And so these people are going to use things like injections from cow or pig insulin. And at first, that worked better than nothing, but then they were able to produce actual human insulin using human genes with bacteria. Now with the pig and cow insulin, that was what they used at first. And like I said, it was difficult to get. It's also going to be very costly and it's not going to be an exact match. So lots of times it would often make humans who took it sick and they'd have some type of reaction to it. So why does some bacteria produce human insulin? We, they produce it by using what's known as recombinant DNA technology. So what happened basically with genetic engineering in 1982, which wasn't long ago, a 29-year-old named Bob Swanson worked with Herbert Boyer on a recombinant DNA technology. This is going to be something new. What they did was they used the restriction enzymes that we talked about to cut the gene for human insulin out of a strand of DNA. Then they took that gene and they inserted it into E. coli. And like I said, it divides about every 20 minutes, so it didn't take a long time in order to make a lot of human insulin. Once they figured this out, they were able to grow vats and vats of this bacterium, which was able to produce insulin. Now scientists are able to produce large amounts of human insulin very quickly and efficiently. This is going to open up a new industry for genetic engineering now that they figured out how to do things like this. So recombinant DNA is going to be DNA of one organism combined with DNA from another organism. So that's what the DNA is called, recombinant DNA. When you put it into the organism, you refer to that organism as a transgenic organism. But its DNA is recombinant because it's a recombination of different types of DNA, basically. And so it's going to create an organism with a desired trait or gene. Usually, it's going to be a corporation of one gene or a set of genes for a specific purpose into another organism. So remember, the DNA is referred to as recombinant DNA. The organism is called a transgenic organism. Try not to get those two confused or mixed up. Several important achievements are going to follow the development of insulin-producing bacteria. And like we said, we've mentioned before, the one was the human growth hormone, or HGH. This is normally produced by the pituitary gland. Sometimes the pituitary gland might um, be underactive. It, sometimes it gets a tumor on it. It can become overactive when a tumor starts to form on it, and it causes things like acromegaly, or it could cause um, giant 
gigantism. And so people grow really, really large depending on when it happens in their life. If it's very early during childhood, it's referred to usually as gigantism and they grow extremely large. If it happens later on in life, let's say 30s, 40s, 50s or so on, it becomes acromegaly where the person starts to grow larger features. They grew normally through childhood, but later on, like their face starts to enlarge, their nose, their arms, their hands, things like that. And so they begin to get like an odd look to them, and it's not going to be very proportionate to the rest of their body. And so with the human growth hormone, that's what's being overproduced in these areas. So the human growth hormone causes growth of um, the body, it causes fat production, and it causes protein synthesis. Sometimes the body, however, does not produce enough human growth hormone. And that's when you end up with people who don't start to develop properly during um, puberty and people who, who end up just with a shorter stature and underdeveloped. They found out though with HGH, it can be used for other things. So it can be used to increase strength and endurance. And if you look over here, that's what they're showing with the boxers. They might take a human growth hormone in order to give themselves an advantage and help grow muscle better. And a long time ago, they used to actually take it from human cadavers. So once someone passed away, they would take the pituitary and they would extract the HGH. Unfortunately, it took a lot to do that and it wasn't very efficient and it was very, very costly. So once they figured out they could insert this gene into bacteria and grow a lot of it, then it made it more affordable and more accessible to everyone. Another thing that they're able to produce is erythropoietin. This is going to be a um, hormone that is going to allow your body to produce red blood cells, more red blood cells. And so EPO is going to be produced by the kidneys. It goes to the red bone marrow. The red bone marrow is then put into action and it starts to produce more red blood cells. More red blood cells could be good if you're anemic and you need to be able to carry more oxygen. It could also help with cancer patients when they're going through things like chemo because their red blood cell count could be lowered and so they would need more EPO. However, this is a big problem in blood doping scandals because if you have more red blood cells, then you can carry more oxygen molecules. If you can carry more oxygen, then you're going to have an advantage because you're going to tire less easily. You're going to be able to go um, longer distance. If you're boxing, you'll be able to go for longer periods of time because you're getting enough oxygen and your muscles aren't going to be oxygen starved. So that leads us to blood doping scandals. It can improve an athlete's performance by basically giving them more endurance. It gives them more oxygen. Lots of times people will go to higher elevations in order to train in thinner air because it causes their red bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. That gives them the ability to carry more oxygen once they're at a lower level of elevation. But the problem with it is, is it can cause Thicker blood and thicker blood can lead to blood clots or strokes. So like we said, it's been at the center of blood doping scandals, especially in things like professional cycling. EPO increases the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and healthy athletes have actually used EPO to improve their athletic performance. Problems, it creates, increases thickness of blood it does put a strain on the heart when it does this and can cause stroke or heart attack. So in summary, biotechnology has led to some, of, some notable successes in treating diseases, usually by producing medicines more efficiently and more effectively than they can be produced with traditional methods. Curing disease with biotechnology. Lots of times we hear about things such as gene therapy and the correction of malfunctioning genes. So with biotechnology and curing disease is got some good and some bad news. The good news is, is that in the 1990s, a handful of humans with normally fatal genetic disease called severe combined immunodeficiency disease or SCID were completely cured by using this. 
However, the bad news with this is that more than 500 trials after that with these gene therapies have been performed and they've had no clear success. So the first time they did this with SCID, everybody was cured. After that, they have not been able to produce the same results. So even the therapy for SCID was going to be suspended and has not been gone back to because of the death related to the treatment. So severe combined immunodeficiency disease is a genetic disorder where a baby's going to be born with an immune system that can't produce white blood cells. So that leaves the person vulnerable to illness. They have no defense against any type of illness that they come in contact with or any um, pathogen. Usually, it's going to cause death within the first year of life because it's hard to keep a child in a completely sterile environment. This is where we have our bubble boy come into play. This man, was, or young man, was born in the 1970s, and he actually made it till 12 years old. But unfortunately, he did die of a respiratory infection because he was exposed, even though they were very careful for 12 years, he did eventually become exposed to a respiratory pathogen. Now, with most um, gene therapy, it is going to be great in theory. Everything on paper looks like it should work, but unfortunately, it does not work out how it seems like it should work. And we're still studying it. We're not sure about that. One thing that we have found out is working with stem cells has given us a lot of hope. Stem cells are going to be cells that have the, develop, the ability to develop into any type of cell that they're put into. So let's say if you add a stem cell to the heart, it'll become a heart cell. It becomes whatever you tell it to become or the body tells it to become. If you put it into a muscle, it becomes a muscle cell. You put it into a bone, it becomes a bone cell. You put it into the brain, it will become a brain cell. So they're completely pliable. So why has gene therapy had such a poor record of success in curing disease? Well, it's usually going to be related to the organisms used to transfer the normal functioning gene into the cells of the person that has the genetic disease. So everything we put it into to try to transfer it, either the cells don't take it up or the wrong cells might take up that gene. So let's say if a skin cell took up the gene for producing insulin, well, that's not going to help you. You need the pancreatic cell to take up that gene. Or if the liver took up that gene, it wouldn't help. So you need to be able to make sure the cells that need it actually take up that gene and not other cells. So it's difficult in getting the working gene into a specific cell where it's needed. It's difficult in getting the working gene into enough of those cells at the right rate to have physiological effect. So even if some of the um, insulin gene got into the pancreatic cells that need it, lots of times not enough of them get it. And so it doesn't work. And then you have problems with the transfer organism getting into unintended cells. So like I said, it could get into a muscle cell or it could get into an intestinal cell. It could get into anything and not intentionally mean to be in that. And then so those cells creating the product is not going to help and could actually cause more damage. So in summary, gene therapies has had a poor record of success in curing human diseases. This stems primarily from the technical difficulties in transferring normal functioning genes into the cells of a person with a genetic disease. Preventing diseases with biotechnology has been popular, so intervening to prevent disease using biotechnology is going to focus on answering questions at three different points in time. Number one. Is a given set of parents likely to produce a baby with a genetic disease? Well, ever since the um, 1960s, late 1960s, they've been screening parents for some genetic disorders. One of those is going to be Tay-Sachs disease. Because they screen for this, they've reduced the number of children born with Tay-Sachs by 75%. Now, these children, remember, usually don't make it past the first years of life. Their lysosomes do not work properly, and lysosomes, remember, get rid of any type of cellular waste. And so it kind of builds up within the cells and causes those cells to rupture and go through apoptosis. Are parents likely to produce a baby with a genetic disease? 
So with these many genetic diseases, they occur only if an individual inherits two genes. That means a copy from the mother and a copy from the father. So it has to get a copy from each parent. Tay-Sachs disease is one of those, also cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia. Individuals with only a single copy of the disease causing disease or gene usually never exhibit that disease. So they may be a carrier, but they don't actually have that disease, but they can pass it on to their children. However, two healthy parents can, like we said, pass that gene on if each one of them is a carrier for the genetic disorder. Number two, will a baby be born with a genetic disease? Well, we've looked at the cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, Down syndrome, and then there's many others. You can go in using biotechnology and you can screen both of the parents and see if they carry these genes. Also, they've made it so they can go in and um, check to see if the baby has these once the baby has been conceived. They can go in and they can check the amniotic fluid or they can do a chorionic villi sampling. So once fertilization occurs, to screen the fetus, one must take a sample, like we said, of the amniotic fluid. So what they're going to do is use an ultrasound and they're going to insert a needle into that amniotic fluid. They're going to draw some of it out and they're going to run the DNA sequence because it will have cells from the baby in that fluid. Another way is the chorionic villus sampling. They'll use an ultrasound again, and then they're going to stick a device, a catheter device, up through the cervix, and they're going to scrape the cells of the placenta. And then they're going to take and analyze those cells to see the genetic makeup of that child. And number three, is an individual likely to develop a genetic disease later on in life? So some diseases won't actually show when they're born, but develop later on. Sometimes it's due to environmental conditions. Sometimes it is just their genetic makeup. It all depends on if those genes are turned on or turned off. And they can turn on and off at any time, and they might never turn on. So things like breast cancer and prostate cancer, you can screen for to see if you have the gene. But the environment can actually change the body, and they might not have the gene for a specific um, disease or specific cancer, but it can still develop because of their environment. Same thing with skin cancer. You might have cancers or melanoma that runs in the family. However, if you don't expose yourself to sun a lot or unprotected sun, then you might never develop it. Or you might not carry the genes in your family, but because you're out in that environment, you might mutate your DNA and cause your body to develop melanoma if you stay in the sun a lot without um, sunscreen and protection. Now, when we do these DNA um, runs and we look at DNA, you do come across some ethical dilemmas. Number one, discrimination. It used to be that if you were known to have a gene for a specific illness or disease, insurance companies would not cover you. Also, you might not be allowed into certain programs, or you might, even to this day, not be allowed to get certain types of life insurance if you are known to carry a specific gene. So really, we've got to consider how do we proceed with this information? Who gets a copy of it? Who gets to know? Lots of people now take DNA tests, and then you can plug it into different apps to see if you carry specific genes for certain things. But to be the most accurate, you need it done by a healthcare professional who can then send it off to be analyzed. Well, if you do that, lots of times insurance pays for it. Since insurance pays for it, they say they have a right to this information. So how do they use this information? Is it right for them to be able to deny you certain life insurance because they know that more than likely you could end up with a specific illness or disease? And so that's one of the big ethical dilemmas. So in summary, biotechnology is going to allow us to identify whether a given set of parents is likely to produce a baby with genetic disease, whether a baby is likely to be born with that genetic disease, and whether an individual carries certain disease-causing genes that may have their effect later on in life. 
So these tools can help us to reduce suffering and the incidence of diseases, but they also come with significant potential cost, particularly the risk of discrimination. Biotechnology is also going to be used in producing agricultural products. For example, modern corn looks nothing like what corn used to look like. So looking at the ancestral corn, it looks more like a type of grass, but we have selected for specific genes over time, and now we have our modern ear of corn. So how might a genetically modified plant help 500 million malnourished people? Well, we have what's referred to as golden rice that they've produced, and it's gonna be nutrient rich. So what they did was they took a gene for beta carotene. Beta carotene is going to help the body produce vitamin A. So they take the beta carotene gene, which they found in daffodils, they're gonna take the gene out, they're gonna take and insert it in with bacteria, and when they add those genes together, they're going to actually insert it into the golden rice or into the white rice, and that's going to produce what's known as golden rice. So about 10% of the world's population is going to suffer from a vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A deficiency causes about 250,000 cases of blindness each year. That is missing a zero. The addition of beta carotene producing genes to that white rice is going to increase the production of vitamin A within the human body. And so that is going to reduce the likelihood of people around the world losing their vision or going blind. So in summary, biotechnology is going to lead to an important improvement in agriculture by using transgenic plants and animals to produce more nutritious food. More efficient and eco-friendly farming with biotechnology has also been proven. Here we have a quote from 1726 Gov Gulliver's Travels. He says, and he gave it for his opinion that whoever could make two ears of corn or two blades of grass to grow upon a spot of ground where only one grew before would deserve better of mankind and to do more essential service to his country than the whole race of politicians put together. And we've actually been able to do that. So almost everyone in the U.S. is going to use genetically modified crops regularly without even knowing it. How many people have eaten the original ancestral corn? Probably not many. Looking here, we see that corn is going to be about 86% genetically modified. Only 14% is going to be of its original corn. Looking at cotton, 93% of that has been genetically modified. And then looking at soybeans, which we use in a lot of products these days, is going to be 93% genetically modified. We also use genetic modification to help with pest resistance. Instead of going out and spraying fields and crops, we can actually insert the gene inside of the plant to get rid of these pests. So how can we genetically modify it to reduce pesticides used? Well, here's what we're going to do. Here we have a corn plant that gets destroyed by insects and pests. We actually took a gene that creates what's known as Bt crystals. We're going to insert it into bacteria, and that bacteria is then going to insert it into the DNA of the plant cell. Once that plant cell takes up that DNA or that gene, it's going to start producing these Bt crystals. Well, Bt crystals, when eaten by insects, causes them to actually get holes in their intestinal tract. So it's going to be toxic to them. And so as these holes start to form in their intestinal tract or digestive tract, they actually start to die. So it will kill the insects and not require us to spray them with a lot of pesticides, which is considered to be very unhealthy. The problem with this is, lots of times you have to worry, well, if it's causing this in insects, it seems to be completely harmless in humans. But what happens over time as it builds up in our systems the more and more we eat this? Could it eventually reach a toxic level that could cause us to become ill? We're not sure. It's only going to take time to tell. So herbicide resistance, this is where we can also use bacteria to insert a specific gene into a plant 
which helps it to resist herbicides so they can spray a crop to kill all of the weeds, but the plant that they're growing will not die from the herbicide because they have the gene in order to make them more sturdy or hardier so they don't react to this herbicide. Another way it's used is to grow faster and bigger bodies. Looking here at these fish, Notice that the one on the bottom is going to be a naturally grown fish, and the one at the top is going to be one that's genetically modified. So what they did was they found a growth hormone that functions year-round instead of just in the summer, and so they inserted it into the fish, and so fish can be raised in 18 months now instead of 24 to 36 months. So it thought that the growth rate would increase by 25% if they did this. But what they found is it actually increased by 500%. So the problem with this is when they release or if one escaped into the wild, since it's so much larger than the normal one, it's going to be able to out-eat and out-maneuver those other fish. So the other fish can't compete. And so the ones that aren't genetically modified will start to die off and they can't survive against the ones that are genetically modified. So in summary, there's going to be a revolution through biotechnology. We have herbicide-resistant and insect-resistant crops that can reduce the environmental and financial cost of producing foods. But then we also have our fears. So fears and risks to the safety of genetically modified foods. Here we see a poor chicken. He is going to be featherless. They have genetically modified him so that he quit growing feathers. Now, he has a couple here and there, but this is going to make it easier for when they go to harvest these chickens because they don't have to pluck the feathers off anymore. Now, unfortunately, this poor guy is going to be more apt or more prone to getting parasitic infections, fungal infections on its skin, and it becomes sunburned. So it's going to live a miserable life because they wanted to make it easier on themselves for not having to pluck the chicken. Other people are going to have concerns, and we're going to go through some of those. For the first concern, organisms that we want to kill may become invincible. Look at bacteria, for example, with all the antibiotics we've used. We've gotten rid of the ones that are easy to get rid of and the ones that are stronger and don't respond to antibiotics or the only ones that seem to stay behind. So we've kind of created a super bug. Concern two, organisms that we don't want to kill may be killed inadvertently. Concern number three, Genetically modified crops are not tested or regulated adequately. So we're not sure what's going to happen over time. If it builds up in our system, could it start to affect our DNA and our genes? Or could it affect our health? Concern number four. Eating genetically modified foods is dangerous. Well, we are not sure yet. It takes time. Concern five. Loss of genetic diversity among crops and plants could be risky. We're getting rid of all of the ones that were naturally forming, and we're changing them over to um, crops that they can't compete with. And concern six, hidden cost may reduce the financial advantages of genetically modified crops. It takes a lot of testing to create these crops. Sometimes it's expensive to insert these genes, so is it even worth it sometimes? In summary, more and more genetically modified foods are being created using modern methods of recombinant DNA technology. Remember, the DNA is recombinant, the organism is transgenic. Right, some legitimate fears among the public remain. However, as to safety of the foods and given that their development relies on such new technology, so it hasn't really been around long enough. All right, starting in with biotechnology, with improving human health, and as far as criminal justice goes, if you know what this picture is, this is Dolly. This is going to be the first organism that we know of that was cloned and actually made it and lived for about six years. Now, with DNA, we've been able to use it as an individual identifier because your DNA is going to be specific to you. And so they're going to be able to go in and do a DNA fingerprint in order to tell different DNA from different people and be able to identify who did what and link people together as relatives. So that's going to become very important in the criminal justice case. 
Here we have a guy named Colin Pitchfork. He raped and murdered two 15-year-old girls in England. But another man confessed to the crime. Now, sometimes this happens. People will go and they, uh, they surrender themselves, say that they did it, and they turn themselves in, but they're actually not the person. Now, why they do this, we don't know. But they're going to take over 5,000 blood samples of men in that area because once they took his blood sample, they realized he was not the perpetrator. And so they can, they go through this area and they take samples of all the men in this area. Once they do this, they still cannot find an identifier. They do not find the match to the DNA that was found in these girls. Colin is going to convince a friend to give blood using his name. And the friend just happened to kind of look like him, so he passed using the ID. And so he gives blood, and of course, he doesn't come back as a match to this crime. But the friend was overheard talking and bragging in a pub about how he was able to go in so easily and give blood for this friend and how they would never get caught. Well, somebody turned them in. And so Colin was going to, he was arrested and tested, and he was found to be a match to both of the crimes. So this is what a DNA fingerprint looks like. So they'll take the crime scene, they'll take the victims, and they'll take the um, people who they suspect. So they'll take the different suspects' DNA. They'll run the DNA, and they look for different sections to match up. So they're looking for these different lines or matches. In order to be able to identify the person correctly, they have to know what to look for. So DNA from humans is going to be about 99.9% .9 identical. So what's actually going to be the difference? Well, they're going to look at things that don't actually code for specific genes in this case. These are referred to as highly variable regions. So you're going to have thousands of these in the human genome. Sometimes these variable regions have repeats. And these repeats are going to be short little sections that repeat themselves over and over again, like GTTG, GTTG, over and over and over again. And they're very short. They're four to five, like GTTG. And so they look for these short tandem repeats, as they're called. And when they find these, they're able to use these to identify the person because these are actually going to be what um, makes us different when we're looking at the DNA. We all might have the same gene for, let's say, eye color and things like that. So these short tandem repeats are actually what they're going to use in DNA fingerprinting to see if it matches up to a crime scene or a victim or a suspect. So it's going to be used as a powerful tool for forensic science. They're going to take the samples that are left behind from things like hair, nails, skin, sperm, and blood and they're going to put them into a um, well, and they're going to run them through a gel using electricity. And so when they do this, it's going to create different markers that you see over to the right-hand side, and all this DNA is going to be unique to the individual. So researchers are going to look for specific regions that are going to be the highly variable regions. And so VNTRs contain variable numbers of tandem repeats. And so these regions, or for a specific number of bases, is going to repeat itself over and over again. It's going to be separated by size. So smallest travels fastest, so it goes further down the line. So if you're looking towards the bottom, those are going to be the smallest sections, so they ran faster when electricity was applied to the liquid and the gel. So creating a DNA fingerprint by using this, so the DNA fingerprint is going to be created by counting the number of times that a repetitive sequence of bases pairs is going to occur on an individual's chromosomes. Regions of repetitive base pair sequences are called, like we said, VNTRs, and that's because the variable number of tandem repeats is what it stands for. So looking at individual A, you have the chromosome of the mother, you have the chromosome of the father, and you put those different sections together. And we have individual B, and you look at those chromosomes there. And you see the chromosomes of mother, chromosomes of father. And you can put them together and make your variable tangent repeats.
And so even different individuals within the same family will have different repeats, but they'll have some things that do match up that can kind of link them as being related. At the bottom of the pictures where the well is, remember I told you, they're going to put the samples into the wells or the openings. You're going to apply an electrical charge. That's going to be a gel that it runs through, and it's going to be sit, sitting in a liquid that has electrolytes in it that will be able to run it down the gel. And then you'll look at the different lines to see which ones match up. This process is referred to as gel electrophoresis. So they take the DNA sample, they use restriction enzymes to cut the DNA in small pieces, they put the samples in the well and add electricity to water that is submerged in, and then it's going to separate by size. So the smallest, remember, runs fastest, so it'll be at the bottom. Then they're going to use that gel to make comparisons. All right, so I'm not sure why it has flipped over, but we'll just go from here. So using this DNA, if you look at the crime scene, you see how you look to compare to see which one it matches up to. And of course, the crime scene does match up to suspect two. So in summary, you use comparisons of highly variable DNA regions that have forensic value in identifying tissue specimens and determining the individual from whom they came. So the DNA sequence is going to reveal evolutionary relatedness. And what they do, they're going to map the genetic landscape. So they look at the Human Genome Project. They started doing this a long time ago. And by the early 2000s, it finally came to its completion. And so they finally mapped the human genome. They thought that it had a lot more um, bases than it actually had. And so with the Human Genome Project, they decoded 3 billion nucleotide base pairs in the human genome and identified all those genes present. Like we said, at near completion around the year 2000, it included how many of these genes worked, where they were located, and how they could even work together with each other. They found genetic material is going to be much smaller than they thought between 20,000 to 25,000 base pairs. Right? So, and with this, those polygenic trees are going to give way to a grouping of organisms in a hierarchical um, system that's going to reflect evolutionary history and relatedness to all organisms. It's going to be useful in organizational systems that help us to understand the diversity of life on Earth and the nature of how species are related to each other. So when we say humans and chimps are genetically 96% identical, what exactly do we mean? Well, for the purpose of comparison, the difference between DNA in the human versus a mouse is going to be 60 times greater than a human and chimp difference. So the difference between the mouse's DNA and the rat is going to be about 10 times greater than that of a chimp and a human difference. And the difference between DNA and a human and a chimp is going to be 10 times greater than the average difference between two humans. And so what we mean is basically everything's made of the same four letters and it's how those letters are put together. Certain ones code for certain fur or hair or eye color, things like that. And some of those might be similar in different organisms. They're not going to be different. And so we're genetically kind of related to a lot of different things. All right, so with genetic similarities. This is going to measure overall DNA similarities between chimps and humans, and it revealed that 96% of our base pairs were the same. So we share greater similarities with chimps than with any other species of animal. But only 29% code for the same proteins. Most of it's going to be junk DNA. So in summary, comparisons of sequences similarities across species reveal the evolutionary relatedness and it makes it possible to construct detailed evolutionary trees. So the promise and perils of cloning. So we go from organs to individuals. Cloning was first done in 1997 by Ian Wilmot, a British scientist who cloned the sheep named Dolly. 
They base their research on a theory from 1938 when Hans Spiemann first proposed removing the nucleus from an unfertilized egg and replacing it with the nucleus from a cell of a different individual. Difficult and inefficient, but it was surprisingly simple as far as a concept goes, and it could be incorporated into six simple steps. First, you're going to isolate an egg cell from one sheep and and they did that in a memory cell from another. And so they remove the nucleus from the egg and they're gonna put in the nucleus from that mammary cell. So they fuse those together. Next on the third step, they initiate cell division. So it goes through mitosis. The fourth step is gonna grow in a culture. And so it's growing in a Petri dish basically. And then once it gets into a form that they can then transfer like they do with in vitro fertilization, they're going to transplant it into the womb of a surrogate mother sheep. She's going to carry that to term, and then the baby will be born. And once she gives birth, that is going to be a clone from the original animal that they took the nucleus from. So it matches the animal that the nucleus came from in the mammary cell. So here we have some different animals that have been cloned since then. Unfortunately, when they do this cloning, they find that these animals do not live nearly as long as the original. And they think mainly because when you're taking the DNA from the nucleus, that DNA is however old that that animal was. So let's say that you wanted to clone somebody who is 60. You could take the DNA from the nucleus, transfer it into an egg, put that after you made it into a um, nice sample. Once it's enough cells that have gone through mitosis, you put that into the womb. It could be carried. The baby's born. It still is born as an infant and goes through all of its cycles and stages. However, its DNA is 60 years old. So the DNA already has some mutations. It's already started to break down. So that baby is starting with very old DNA, so it's not going to live as long as someone who is starting with fresh new DNA. So are there any medical justifications for cloning? Well, different uses that we, uses that we have for cloning are like transgenic animals that contain human genes. They can be very valuable. Uh, sheep, for instance, that produce the human protein alpha-1 antitrypsin, that's going to be effective in treating things like cystic fibrosis. We have hamsters that produce human erythropoietin, which is going to help treat kidney disease. And remember, that's going to create your EPO, which makes more red blood cells. Also, we have pig clones, too, that are being used to create things like organs that we can then transplant into humans. The pigs are going to be unusual and useful because they're going to have genes inactivated that would normally cause their tissue to reject it by the immune system of the recipients. But they work. So is it possible to clone a dinosaur and how would that be done exactly? Well, in order to do that, you would have to find an intact cell that had DNA that has not degraded any. So kind of like what they did with Jurassic Park, where they were able to take that mosquito or whatever that insect was and take the cells out of it because it had been preserved and then insert those into an egg cell and then implant it into a surrogate that would carry it. So first we'd have to find intact DNA that had no damage, no degradation, no breakdown to it. Then we'd have to figure out what organism could actually carry that dinosaur. And so we would then implant it into a surrogate that would be able to carry it. Now, just because you can do something, you have to go back and think, should I? We all saw what happened in Jurassic Park. It did not turn out well. So in summary, cloning of individuals has potential benefits in agriculture and in medicine, but we do have ethical questions that do linger. Just because we can, should we? Okay, and that's going to end us for this section of notes. Like I said, I apologize. I'm not sure what happened. Um, as far as the PowerPoint presentation, I stopped it for a minute because somebody was at the door, and then when I went back, it wouldn't go back into PowerPoint mode. So I will see you back here with Unit 6.